This is Tim Sanders, and you are watching Voices of Authority, brought to you by Upwork. Today, our guest is Rohit Bhargava. He's an author of multiple books, Lycanomics, the Non-Obvious Trends series, and the brand new Non-Obvious Guide to Virtual Work. He's a researcher, and overall, a nice guy. Welcome to the show, Rohit. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Tim. It's such a pleasure. Talk to us about non-obvious thinking and why it's so important these days. Yeah, my non-obvious thinking is sort of my way of describing trying to teach people how to see the world in unusual ways. Mm. And the reason why I find it so important right now is because it's really easy to get narrow-minded. Yeah. Uh, and not because we're bad people, but just because of the way that the information that we consume is is delivered to us. Yeah. And we really have to try harder to break out of that. Now, you talk about how non-obvious thinking can also make us very resilient. I believe that resilience is so important in 2020 with the multiple layers of crises. Talk to us about that. Yeah, resilience is, is I mean, if you think about it, resilience is, is really being able to respond to stressful situations. It's being able to respond when things go wrong. And to me, the best way to respond when things go wrong is from a place of knowledge. If you don't know what to do, the response you're going to have is panic mm -hmm. uh, because you just you don't have any certainty. You don't have any direction. Yeah. Whereas if you have more knowledge, you can have more of a perspective that allows you to figure out what to do, how to, you know, whatever the buzzword is you want to use, pivot, change, you know, rethink, whatever, you know, disrupt. Uh, there's lots of words used for basically the same thing, which is doing something different when things go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. G give me an example of how you've used non-obvious thinking here in 2020 to adapt to disruption. That's two for two buzzwords, one sentence. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And 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 look, I, uh, you and I, I think are, are are similar in the sense that I mean, we're both uh, as at least as some part of our uh, daily roles, a paid professional keynote speaker, which means we rely on real life events where we get paid to go on stage and, and deliver a talk. And now the challenge is all of those live events have sort of gone away because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. And so it becomes so much more important to then think about, well, if I can't do that, what can I do instead? And what should I do instead? Mm -hmm. And the, the first thing to, 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 to rethink is, well, I'm not just going to wait this out. I'm not just going right. to hope that everything comes back so that yeah. I can do what I was doing before. That doesn't work. Right. So we've got to think differently. And so for you, and I saw you really pivot quickly on this, you thought differently about the nature of virtual meetings themselves. Um, you've given such great advice between your YouTube videos as well as your, your keynote addresses delivered virtually on the subject of how to run a better virtual meeting. Give us just a few insights that you've developed this year on how to create a better virtual meeting, whether it's say an internal meeting, like to update the team, uh, like the annual conference they used to have, or maybe whether mm -hmm. it's a customer-based event. Well, the first thing that, that I really rethought, at least for myself, was mm. if I'm going to go virtual with all of these talks, uh, I can't just try my hardest to recreate what the stage was like from home. Right. And you know, some people have done that, right? They've mm. created a home studio with literally a stage. Yeah. Uh, they've bought crazy lights and they've essentially set up like a home theater. Yeah. Uh, and they present. And one of the things that I would teach, I mean, I used to teach uh, speaking to students. And one of the things yes. I would talk about is, look, you always want to be standing because the energy is so much better when you're standing. Yeah. And I do absolutely zero of my virtual keynotes standing. Right. Me neither. Uh, which is very new for me. And the reason why I do that is because, I mean, I'm sitting at home in my office. Yeah. And the way I present is as if you were sitting here with me and yeah. we're just having a conversation. So I'm not trying to pretend like I'm on stage, even though I'm actually at home right. and pretend like I'm wearing pants when I'm not. Uh, you know, instead, I'm taking advantage of what benefits this environment has because yeah. now I can actually show you what's around me in my office, right? It's yeah. much more real. In my second book, The Likeability Factor, I talked about realness as an attribute people develop that makes them easier to like. 
And it's based on psychological research. Basically, it says people really need real. That's why reality shows work so well. And in fact, a lot of the research suggests that during the most trying times, you actually don't escape to fantasy or an imaginary world. You find so much more comfort in feeling like you're dealing with the real. Exactly what you're talking about here, Rohit. You know, you're talking about the idea that we need to take advantage of the exact place we are at at the moment. And by sitting and by displaying your office, I think people find comfort in that. Yes, they do. Uh, they also get a sense of you as a person. And I already knew just as a, as a speaker on stage that before they'll listen to you intellectually, they have to connect with you personally. Right. And so a lot of the style that I would use on the stage would be to tell a personal story from something that I've done or let them into my world so that they can see me on stage and not think, oh, here's this speaker guy that's going to be intellectually telling us about these trends based on all of his research because it's all about the research. Instead, what I want them to do is say, oh, he's struggling with the same things I'm struggling with. He right. sees the world in a way that I see the world or that I'd like to see the world. Because yes. once you have that connection, then they'll pay attention to everything else. Absolutely. And I think empathy is the word of the year. I think more than ever, uh, <laughs> yeah. we have to learn how to take another person's perspective, um, how to reveal uh, vulnerability, uh, how to yep. reveal vulnerability on our own. Um, talk to me a little bit about the role of empathy from your point of view um, is a trend, if you will. I know you've talked about this uh, and mm -hmm. how it might impact things like marketing and leadership. You know, empathy, I think a lot of times is mistaken for uh, or used as a synonym for kindness, as in just right. be nice to people. Right. And that's actually not what it is, what it's meant right. to be, right? right? I mean, being nice to people or kindness is an output of having empathy. Mm -hmm. But to me, empathy is really about being able to understand someone's situation who's totally unlike you yeah, and be okay with it. And yeah. I think a lot of times what people say is, and, and this word is thrown around of, along with diversity uh, of tolerance, which I hate. I hate that word. Yeah. Because tolerance to me says, oh, I tolerate you being wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though yeah. I know I I'm right and you're wrong, which is so stupid. I mean, that's not the way to think about uh, how to understand a perspective other than yours. And, and so right. to me, empathy is really being able to put yourself into someone else's world. And there's yeah. a few things that I specifically do to try and, and make sure that I constantly do that. And one of them is that I read things that I don't agree with. I read uh, uh, and, and consume content that I don't really like. And, and more importantly, I consume content that I shouldn't be interested in and I'm not. And what I mean by that is I'm reading, for example, magazines that are targeted to people who have interests or who are from a uh, age group that I'm not part of. So I'll read yeah. Teen Vogue magazine, which is for 16 year old girls. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm okay. not there's no reason for me to read that other than understanding the world from a different perspective. that's not my own. Right. And that's so important because social media doesn't do that for us. Right. Like just sitting there surfing through whatever uh your platform of choices, whether it's Facebook or, or Instagram or, or TikTok, you're basically going to see stuff from people who think the way you think. Absolutely. And, and that's a super narrow view of the world. Yeah. It's an echo chamber to say the very least. I'll back up a little bit here. I want to geek out on something. You talked about the idea that you make this sincere attempt to see things from another person's point of view and you're okay with that. And that is exactly what the great psychologist Carl Rogers wrote about. That which is most general is most personal. And he talked about the idea that the, the, the empathic person treats other people's feelings as facts because guess what? They are facts. They're not opinions uh, to be criticized, if you will. And I believe, Rohit, the reason empathy does make us seem kind or does deliver kindness as a benefit has to do with the psychological benefit that one delivers in a true moment of empathy. And that psychological benefit is validation. Let's now apply that to marketing as a trend. Why is empathy so critical in 2020 for marketers? Well, I think it's uh, it's always been important to some degree, but we've mm -hmm. used different terminology for it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we instead of calling it empathy, we call it customer insight. 
yep. or focus group or, you know, there's lots of marketing terms to basically describe this idea that, look, we should know what our customers care about. Right. Uh, and that's important. Right. One of the things that I think has become more apparent over time is when you start to continually do that at every stage yeah. of marketing, it becomes transformational. And what I mean by that is, it, you know, I've spent enough time advising companies and looking at marketing strategies to know that this phase, and it is a phase, of customer insight development is something that happens at a specific time, a point in time. And right. usually it's before you launch the campaign, it's before you launch the product, mm -hmm. and then you launch. And you don't revisit at that point to say, what do people really think? Because that is someone else's department. Yeah. It's no longer marketing, it's customer experience, it's, right. it's customer service, it's something else by someone else. And the marketing mentality is, let's understand who we're trying to influence so we can better influence and persuade them. Right. The customer service mentality is, let's fix their problems. Right. And when you're focused on fixing problems, uh, you may be successful at fixing the problem, but you're not generating any insight from that. And so what ends up happening is you're fixing the same problem over and over again, and nobody right. really shares the information with the people who need to know so that they can fix the reason why the problem happened in the first place. Oh, that's, and that's yeah. the problem. Like That's what happens. And this is not a big company only thing. Right. I see this happen in companies of all sizes. There's just this disconnection. And speaking of shifting, mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the Non-Obvious Trends book series. Tell us where it came from. The Non-Obvious Trends series has been a 10-year project in my mm. life from 2010 until 2020. Wow. And I say that because in January of 2020, I published the Non-Obvious Megatrends book, mm. which is the final book in the series. Yeah. And that one really looked at the last 10 years of research and laddered it up to 10 big shifts, 10 mega trends, as I called them, that are changing the way that we believe, we buy, we sell, and mm. we, we interact with one another. And it started with sort of this annual trend report. It, at one point, it was just a trend report that I would publish mm -hmm. online as a PowerPoint, and that was it. Eventually, it turned into a book in the fifth year of me doing this annual report and building hundreds of thousands of people kind of following it and, and wanting the next annual edition of it, right. uh, I published a book about the, the process behind it. So how can you learn to predict trends for yourself? And that's what the book was. And that one oh. hit the bestseller list. And that was yeah. kind of around the time when I left my day job and kind of branched out and became an entrepreneur too. And every year there's new versions of the trends and different trends. And the lens that I've typically looked at uh, over the past 10 years is what are the biggest cultural and, and business trends that are affecting everything that we do from a professional point of view? So mm. our workplace culture, uh, how we work, how we sell, how we buy, how we consume, all of those things. It was a fascinating journey. And I say 2010 to 2020 because the non-obvious megatrends version of the book was the final edition. So this was mm. kind of a cap of the project. And to me, what it allowed me to do is really have a perspective over a long period of time and a short period of time into right. what does it take to be able to see what's going to happen in the future. The, yeah. as I call it in the book, the accelerating present. Right. How do you pay attention to the accelerating present in a way that helps you prepare for the future? Mm -hmm. And that's really what the series has been about. So what did, you know, if you were to give a few pieces of advice on how a person can see what's next. I'm actually showing one of my favorite books of all time, uh, Clayton Christensen, Seeing What's Next. Not his most famous book, but one of my favorite books. It's a code I've always been trying to crack. So give us some advice. How do we see what comes next? How can we develop that mental muscle? So there's, there's a few things that are central to this technique that I use, uh, and I call it trend curation, but mm. specifically the method behind it is something I call the haystack method. Okay. And the haystack method is sort of a play off of the cliche of finding a needle in a haystack, because a lot of times that's what people think a trend is. It's finding the needle yes. in the haystack. Yes. And instead, the method, what it says is if you spend enough time gathering the hay, you can take your own needle and stick it in the middle and say, this is what it means. Ah. So it's a much more empowering way. You're not looking for this thing that may or may not be there that's impossible to find. Right. You're actually spending the time gathering the hay so that you can decide for yourself, what does all of this mean? And the gotcha. hay in this case is stories. Uh, and the more stories we're able to uh, gather, 
the more we can start to see patterns that develop between them. And that's really gotcha. what the method is about. It's about right. finding the patterns. Right. That's great. Oh, that's excellent. I love that. So you released the 2020 non-obvious mega trends in January. The world changed in March. Yes. Yep. So why don't you update from your point of view based on some patterns obviously you've been noticing. Give us the fall mega trends update based on the stories that you've been observing over the last few months. You know what, the, the question I get most often uh, considering the timing as you just pointed out of when the book came out versus mm -hmm. when the world changed uh, is are these trends still relevant uh -huh. now that we've had a pandemic and the world is totally different? Right. And my process for looking at trends and evaluating them has a high, I think a very high amount of candor attached to it. Okay. And what I mean by that is every year uh, we would go back and look at previously predicted trends and try to determine whether those trends were still valid and then give each one literally a letter grade that okay. we would publish in the book. And some of them would get low letter grades because they didn't last over time. So there was a lot of authenticity and transparency attached to this process kind of leading up to megatrends, mm -hmm. which was good because we had a heritage of doing that uh, in the team. When it came to the trends from the megatrends edition, because they had been developing over the last 10 years and they were really kind of elevated ideas, what happened was some of them started accelerating faster than I ever would have imagined. So for example, one of the trends was talking about instant knowledge, this idea that okay. we expect to be able to learn anything faster yes. because we have YouTube and we have all of these different tools at our disposal. Exactly. And now we're in a world where everybody's virtual learning, kids are not going to school anymore, they're learning how to use technology. And like these, these skills that we're building to be able to learn in this way are not things that will disappear once the pandemic finally is over. Right. You know, those skills will stay with us. So many cases of the trends and the situation that happened since those trends were first written about is that they've accelerated faster now because of the pandemic. So I, I like that distinction you make that you don't think that after the pandemic, it's really going to change these mega trends. Let's apply some of the mega trends you identified in your 2020 edition to leadership. What are a couple of the non-obvious mega trends that leaders should be paying attention to right now? One of the non-obvious mega trends that I think has big implications for leadership is a very strategic one. Uh, and what I uh, what I called it was flux commerce. Okay. And flux commerce really had two elements to it. One was the idea that what used to be different industries mm -hmm. is now starting to blur the lines between industries are starting to blur. So you've got everything from uh, Taco Bell opening a hotel to banks opening coffee shops to Crayola uh, making makeup and entering fashion. All of these are examples of brands that were in wow. solely in a single sector starting to cross boundaries. And that's a huge shift because now it's no longer, okay, I'm in my lane and you're in yours. It's right. we're going to start crossing these. And the other shift that, that relates to that is business model shift. So what we used to buy and own, we now subscribe to and share. Right. And you're seeing that across many different platforms. So you're seeing yeah. people subscribe to cars instead of buying them. You can subscribe right. to uh, software. You don't buy that anymore. And so like these business models of, of how we pay for the things that we consume are shifting as well. And all of these point to the need for any leader of any organization to reimagine two things that seemed unchangeable, right? I mean, no matter what new products you, you launch, you're still in the same industry, right? Yeah. Well, maybe not. And no matter what you sell, you're still selling it in the same way, right? Maybe not. So this is what it means to start reimagining these very core fundamental elements of what we do and what we sell. And, and you know, this is happening when it comes to consumption and products, but it also, it's also happening when it comes to the future of work, like how we work. So let's talk about the future of work. Um, connect some non-obvious trends to workplace, perhaps uh, collaborative problem solving, or even just the value chain. Talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the future of work. One of the biggest shifts I'm seeing when it comes to thinking about the future of work is a awakening from workers mm -hmm. of what needs to happen in person 
and what is better to happen not in person. Yes. And I think that we're right now in a point where, of course, we're all doing this virtual work thing. And, and so justifiably, we're sick of it. And eventually, one day, when, when the pandemic finally kind of reaches that, that point where people are allowed to go back into offices, and this will be different in different places, right? So it's not going to happen all at once on one right. day for everyone. But right. whenever it does happen, uh, there are some predictab predictable things that will happen as a result of it. The first thing is that everyone's going to be so thankful to get back to work that there'll be a honeymoon phase right. of probably two weeks, three weeks, maybe longer, where we're just so grateful to be back in the office that we'll go every day and we'll love it. Yeah. And after that honeymoon phase wears off, people will remember that it's not fun to sit in your hour in your car for an hour a day right. commuting. And it's not fun to sit on the train. And uh, it's not a good time to be stuck in the office and not be able to be home. And we'll start to miss that flexibility that we used to have to not have to get dressed up and deal with makeup and put on pants and whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever else we were able to avoid. Right. And once that happens, I think we'll start to deliver on this hybrid future that some people yeah. are talking about where yeah. some days we'll go into work, some days we won't. And the days that we do go into work will be much more collaborative because we'll say, look, I'm in the office. So of course I want to be meeting with people. I'm not going to just shut my office door if I even have an office door uh, and with more open plan offices like that doesn't even exist anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll choose to be more collaborative because I'll get my real work, quote unquote, done when I'm working from home or when I'm working remotely in another location, right? Maybe not home. And so that is such an important shift because what it says is we become the custodians of how we work most effectively for ourselves. Right. right. And that has never really happened before. I mean, mm -hmm. we've always had the situation where where we worked was typically dictated to us, apart right. from some enlightened companies that said, look, work wherever you want. It doesn't matter to us. Right. Mm -hmm. But that was a minority of companies. Very most companies small. said, look, you have to come into the, yeah, exactly. Then most companies say you have to come into the office. We need you here at this time. No, you can't be over there. We need you to get on a plane and go to that meeting because like, we just need you there. And you know, now I, people have realized they don't have to. So what I hear you saying is there's going to be a lot more intentionality behind why we go into the office after this honeymoon phase is over. Talk to me. Not and, only, yeah. Go ahead. Um, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say not only intentionality, but also kind of self-awareness uh -huh. of how each of us works most effectively. Because look, the truth is some people are more extroverted than others in the classic sense, which means they do right. their best work when they're around people and they get energized by people. Yes. Whereas, you know, introverts typically get energized by not being around people, by having quiet mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need both types of people to succeed right. in the workplace of the future. Right. Right. I, I can just see a Myers-Briggs spinoff you know, for doing assessments <laughs> to understand the person who's gonna work the best in an office environment around people versus someone who may do better, you know, working remotely. So I think that's really interesting. I think that should come from uh, someone who's a VP of Customer Insights. I mean, that's well, probably the place where it would come from. I'm well, I'm going to get to work know? on that one. I'm going to get to work <laughs> on that one. You, you, still, um, you still have me reeling from the concept of a Taco Bell Hotel. You just got to give me a detail or two about that because I'm still it was, um, stuck on that. It was wildly, wildly pop popular. Hmm. And, um, and they had, the odd thing was, I think they had hot sauce in the rooms, but you had to get the food from somewhere else. So I'm not exactly sure how that worked or what that was, but apparently for the short period of time that they did it, it was totally booked out and, and people loved it. I mean, there are some super fans of, of Taco Bell out there. Oh believe yeah, it or not. I've met a few. Earlier this year, you gave a virtual keynote for a marketing uh, trade association. You talked about non-obvious megatrends for marketing. Share some of those insights with us because we have a lot of people watching. Uh, they're in the marketing function at their organization. Yeah, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about the implications of some of these trends for marketing, but also mm -hmm. kind of who's doing marketing right when it comes to rethinking this. And, and what I'm finding over and over again is that the brands that are able to inject more of a personality, the ones that are able to have more of a uh, polarizing view in some cases, uh, are the ones that are really standing out because they they stick out as understanding the situation and being unafraid to be who they are. 
So everything from Patagonia putting labels on their clothing, telling you to uh, vote the assholes out. That's literally what the labels say. Yeah, I see And in their opinion, the assholes are the ones who are uh, politicians who don't believe in climate science, right? Because they're an Mm -hmm. outdoors oriented brand. Right. So it's totally on brand for them. Uh, All the way through to uh, you've got like more and more brands saying, look, we're going to take you behind the scenes of what we do and how we do it. And we're going to create content around that because the more you know about how we operate as humans, uh, the more you will feel bonded to us. Mm -hmm. And that has been a constant in marketing, but perhaps even more important right now. Interesting. So the polarizing view. Give me another example of a polarizing view. I love I love this this talk track. There are so many brands in in certain sectors that do it. So athletic wear companies um, taking a stand by supporting athletes who are controversial, right, in terms mm-hmm. of kneeling during the national anthem and right. things like Nike, that. Nike, for example, here. yes. Yeah, Nike, but also you know Adidas, also Under Armour. I mean, they all kind of take stands of some sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see that a lot with the outdoors retailers, not only Patagonia, also REI, also North Face. I mean, you know, many of them uh, on the food side, you're starting mm-hmm. to see more and more of that. I mean, you saw this big shift uh, where many brands that had uh, heritages that people considered racist. So mm-hmm. Uncle Ben's Rice, for example, mm-hmm. decided they were going to change their their brand, right? Uh, which is a right. big deal. I mean, these brands have been around for 100 years. Right. Uh, and now they're starting to shift. I mean, there's really an awakening when it comes to branding and marketing around not only what is the brand. It used to be that if you had a powerful brand, it meant that you had recognition, right? Right. You had brand recognition and that's what the brand was for. So if people saw it on the shelf, they'd be like, oh, I know what that is. And that was it. That was all that mattered. If they recognized it, maybe they'll be more inclined to buy it and they'll pay the extra four cents for Uncle Ben's rice versus some other rice. Right. Right. And now the brand has to say something. It's not enough to just be recognized, right? We need to actually say something. And so these brands that are highly recognizable are really struggling to find a point of view that that resonates in the world, right? I mean, Coca-Cola, most recognized brand in the world, apart from the the Red Cross. I think there was like a study. It was like Red Cross and then Coca-Cola. That was like, those were like the two most recognized brands everywhere in the world, even in highly remote places. Yeah. And now, you know, what does Coca-Cola stand for? Right. Can't stand for the soda beverage because people know that's unhealthy and not doing something good to their bodies right. in the world. So it's got to stand for something else. And, and that is one of the major struggles that a brand of that size and that type of heritage is going to face because we're in this quest for brand relevance as yes. opposed to brand recognition. Yes. So this is a great discussion of brand. I geek out a lot when I think about it. Um, Dwayne Knapp uh, wrote a great book years and years ago called The Brand Mindset, and I'll never forget how he laid it out. There's differentiation, there's relevance, there's esteem, and there's awareness. And what I see you talking about here is this marriage uh, between relevance and esteem. They're no longer separate. They become the same. Yeah. Yeah. In a world like we're yeah, in and now. I think uh, I think that brands who who have that esteem, I mean, they're certainly they have the relevance. Uh, I think when you're on the smaller side of the scale, right? And I think about this as an entrepreneur and a small business owner myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not as focused on recognition because uh, you know that is a very high bar that requires frequency and and yeah. oftentimes ad spending that I just don't have the budget for. Right. Uh, instead, what I'm trying to focus on is uh, brand value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is the value that I'm trying to put out in the world and what am I trying to say with the brand that I have that is a perspective that other people can get behind? Uh, and if I can use that to differentiate, which is the number one priority, right? right. I need to be different yes. than everyone else. If they know what the difference is, then that is the battle right there. Absolutely. Um, I always ask people, I ask, uh, what's the difference between calamari and squid? Five bucks. <laughs> uh, Five you, bucks. Are you... <laughs> yeah, to I your mean, point. you know, look, we have the the entire marketing industry has so many examples of this. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the one of the classic examples I've used in marketing classes with students before is um, pregnancy tests. Mm. Uh, they're exactly the same in most right. cases, but yep. one packaging features uh, a, a couple with a baby, and because somebody's buying it out of hope, right. and another features this is a fast test and it's super accurate. Yeah, uh, because that person's buying it out of fear. Yeah, and it's the same product, but the buying circumstance is very different among yeah. those two user wow. sets, uh, and so the packaging is different. Right, 
Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Great insights here. Great. Let's um, let's turn the page to your most recent work, the non-obvious guide to virtual work. Talk to us a little bit about some of the key insights that you deliver in that book. We've got it here on the screen, uh, and we're going to help uh, viewers understand where they can get this um, at the end of the show. Yeah, this guide was really uh, written out of necessity. I sure. uh, wrote. I started writing it the day after South by Southwest got canceled in March right. 2020. Well, you had a big keynote and there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I did it virtually, <laughs> but it just wasn't the same. <laughs> um, but that was really kind of the first moment where we knew, okay, this is going to last for some amount of time, or at least right. I knew at that point. And so I, I wrote this book to do two things. Number one, go out to the smartest people that I knew about this topic of virtual work and gather right. their insights. And so there's right. more than 50 perspectives from different experts Okay. on what you can do to be better at everything from working remotely without getting lonely to presenting in a virtual meeting to facilitating virtual meetings. I mean, all of these are topics that are covered in the book. And so the sure. first thing is I wanted to just get all that insight. And the second thing was that I wanted to put together a really practical, short guide that would be step one, step two, step three. And it's part of a series that we launched actually under the non-obvious brand called the Non-Obvious Guide series. And this is mm. one of the books, the Non-Obvious Guide Got to it. Virtual Work that I've written. But there's lots of other ones from other authors. And the idea is that we could perhaps take on one small element of the dummies guides, which are totally ubiquitous, but mm. also totally bloated and pretty mm -hmm. useless uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to it. Because they're all 400 pages long and right. they're literally dictionaries of everything you could possibly want to know. And the, the dummies guide to uh, social media spends a page defining what a friend is. I mean, no one needs that. No one's that dumb, even though it's a dummies guide. Right. And so the not obvious guides are the tagline is like having coffee with an expert. Yeah. And the perspective that it says on the back at the top is smart advice for smart people. Right. And that's really how they're meant to be written. And that's what Got I tried it. to do in this guide. So one of the complaints I hear from leaders of companies about remote work, whether it's Jamie Dimon or Reed Hastings, is that we can't collaborate effectively virtually. Give us some tips on how we can do a better job of collaborating from a distance. There's a couple of reasons why virtual collaboration doesn't work and why it's hard. Uh, the first is because mm -hmm. oftentimes virtual collaboration, the first thing we're trying to recreate when it comes to virtual collaboration is that beautiful in-person brainstorm right. meeting. Right. And that is almost impossible to do virtually. So if yeah. your goal is to create a great brainstorming meeting yeah. virtually, you're going to fail. Uh, because that's not the ideal use case for doing something virtually, uh, mm. because it's very hard to recreate. Right. But that doesn't mean the virtual collaboration can't work. For example, you know, here's a, a situation many people would recognize. If you've ever used uh, a online platform for a document, let's say like Google Docs. I use it all the time. And you're working on the same document that someone else is working on uh, simultaneously. Yeah, how would you do that in a meeting? Right. That would be much more difficult, right? Yeah. So here's a situation where virtual collaboration on a single document where you're literally line editing together is way better yeah. with virtual tools. And so yeah. that's what we need to try and shift our perspective to. What yes. are the situations and the tasks and the things that are better served through virtual collaboration okay. and not try so hard to just do the same thing we used to do with collaboration in person virtually because oftentimes that fails. A common theme on this series has been the distinction between real-time collaboration and asynchronous collaboration like what you've just described. What's your perspective on asynchronous collaboration um, as being more inclusive, especially of people um, who are introverted or quite frankly, very junior in an organization and not likely to speak up during a meeting, if you will? Asynchronous um, collaboration is super important to get more people involved. But I would argue, I mean, that the, the use case I just said of editing a document at the same time, that's not asynchronous. Right. You're right. in different places, but that's actually synchronous. You're doing it at the same time. And so, you know, asynchronous to me it really works well. For example, if you have teams in different time zones, okay. if you can't get everyone together for a single meeting, if you have multiple phases of a project, I mean, mm -hmm. these are all situations where asynchronous collaboration becomes really 
important. I mean, look, I, I one of my companies is a publishing company, a book publishing company called Idea Press. Mm -hmm. And we collaborate all the time across multiple resources, right? Because you have editors, you have proofreaders, you have interior layout designers, you have ebook designers, you have cover designers. I mean, these are all different people who need to collaborate with one another. But their collaboration usually is asynchronous. It goes from yeah. one person to the next person. It gets handed yeah. off from person to person. And everyone's working virtually, but they're never working on the same document at the same time. Hardly right. ever. Right. And right. so we need deep collaboration. But doing it virtually in an asynchronous way is, uh, is preferable. Yeah. Right? You wouldn't want everybody in the same room at the same time because the cover designer is doing something totally different than what the proofreader oh. and fact checker is doing. You write about how to be remotely innovative, and I want to finish this talk track with you expanding on that. I'm curious, how can I be remotely innovative? So <laughs> being remotely innovative is kind of a funny way of saying it because I know, uh, and I've said it because uh, it sounds like I'm saying to people, just be a little bit innovative, like be remotely innovative, not a lot innovative. But actually what we mean is how do I be innovative when I'm working by myself? Like how right. do I be innovative when I'm not surrounded by inspiration, by people? Right. And to me, being remotely innovative in that sense requires you to go outside of your usual perspective. It requires you to bring in new sources of inspiration. You need to watch more video. You need to listen to more talks. You need to read more things. You need to mm -hmm. consume different information. And we really have to be uh, curators of all of this information and, and really seek it out so that we can uh, become smarter. And one of my favorite quotes for describing this is something that Isaac Asimov said in, a, in mm -hmm. an interview, the famous science fiction writer. Sure. When asked about how he consumed information, he said, I I'm not a speed reader. I'm a speed understander. Mm. And that to me is, is really what we could, should aspire to be, speed understanders, where we consume all of this stuff and then we start to figure out what it really means. I think this is a great place for us to end the conversation on such a high note. Rohit, you have been an amazing guest. You are literally a wealth of information. I want to thank you for being on the show. Your URL is below. I want to invite everyone watching to go take a look at his books, especially his newest work, The Non-Obvious Guide for Virtual Work. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Thanks for the conversation.